Good morning and a warm welcome to everyone gathered here in the sanctuary and who are listening via church telephone or through the internet. May we be encouraged, challenged, and blessed as we receive instruction from God's word and as we praise him. Uh, a number of announcements this morning. We'd like to officially welcome Reese Kickert, who has um, had his membership transferred uh, to here. And we also welcome James and Stephanie Zweep, along with Grace and Liam. They've been worshiping with us for some time, and now their membership has been finalized as well. A couple of announcements, just a reminder about Compassion Care. Um, there's a presentation here in Vineland on Thursday, September 14. That'll be at 7.30. Um, see the bulletin for uh, details. And then there's another presentation also um, at 7.30, but next week, um, or two weeks out, on September 28 in Zion. So um, have a look in the bulletin. And then just a note for Sunday school parents, after the morning service, um, if you could pick up your kids, uh, the kindergarten and grade one students at 11 o'clock. There's an opening this morning and then pick up your kids at 11. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 92, verses 13 through 15, where it says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Let's sing together from Psalter 251, verse 3. So that's Psalter 251, verse 3. Congregation, the Lord has called us together to worship him, and we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus is an overflowing fountain of good. Amen. Receive the greeting of the Lord, grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us praise God with singing words from Psalter number 247, rendition of Psalm 90, 247, we'll sing stanza 1, 4, 5, and 6, 1, 4, 5, and 6 of 247.
God is our guard through life and God also seeks to guide us in life and that is by means of his law as he humbles us and points us to his son in whom is salvation, forgiveness for our sins and then also by his Holy Spirit leading us in the way that we should walk in thankfulness and in praise to him. And again this Lord's Day we have the opportunity to hear the law and it'll be from Exodus 20 and the summary from Mark 12 that we'll hear God's law and then Sing from Psalter 233, 233, 1, 2, 3, and 6. 233, 1, 2, 3, and 6. So God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, which is the first commandment of all. Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these.
Let us turn in God's word further as we worship the Lord to the book of Psalms and read together from Psalm 123 and Psalm 124. The sermon this morning will address the last words of the Lord's Prayer where the Lord Jesus teaches us to pray and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. All those words also as addressed in Lord's Day 52. We come this morning to the end of the catechism, Lord's Day 52. But as background reading, we'll read these uh, two psalms, and we often think of Psalm 121 as the traveler's psalm, and that's true, but in a way, Psalm 120, 120 through 134 are traveler's psalms. Often the pilgrims would sing these words on their way to the holy city, and so we'll just read two of them. Uh, 123 and 124, which speak also of the Lord's keeping, our need for it, our trust in Him, and when also we have been delivered and brought safely through. So Psalm 123, a song of ascents. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. A song of ascents of David. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers, the snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So far the reading of God's word. And then let's turn in the catechism to Lord's Day 52. Lord's Day 52, page 87, where we have the last words of the Lord's Prayer explained further for us and where we also confess these truths the meaning of these words and the riches of them. So question 27, which is the sixth petition? And the answer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is, since we are so weak in ourselves that we cannot stand a moment. And besides this, since our mortal enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, cease not to assault us. Do thou therefore preserve and strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may not be overcome in the spiritual warfare but constantly and strenuously may resist our foes till at last we obtain a complete victory. How do you conclude your prayer? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That is all these we ask of you because you being our King and Almighty are willing and able to give us all good and all this we pray for, that thereby not we, but your holy name may be glorified forever. What does the word Amen signify? Amen signifies it shall truly and certainly be. For my prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart that I desire these things of him. And finally, before we go to prayer, let's read from the form that you find in these booklets in your pews from page 7, because we hope to celebrate the Lord's Supper next Sunday, next Sunday, Lord willing, and we want to have, we want to begin then this morning with preparing ourselves. And so on page 7, we'll read through page 9, where we have a form that helps us to uh, think through what it means to examine ourselves and to come to the Supper of the Lord, to participate in the Supper in faith. So, page 7. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Listen to the words of this institution as they are described by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That we may now celebrate the supper of the Lord to our comfort, it is necessary rightly to examine ourselves and further to consider carefully that purpose for which Christ has ordained this sacrament, namely to do this in remembrance of him. True self-examination consists of three parts. First, that each of you can carefully consider your sins and the curse due for them, so that you loathe and humble yourself before God, considering that the wrath of God against sin is so great that he, rather than leaving it unpunished, has punished it in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with the bitter and shameful death of the cross. Second, that each of you examine whether you also believe this trustworthy promise of God that all your sins are forgiven only through the cross of Jesus Christ and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is graciously imputed to you as your own, indeed so completely as if you personally had satisfied for all your sins and fulfilled all righteousness. Third, that each of you carefully examine your own conscience to see if you are determined to show true thankfulness to God in every area of life and to walk sincerely before his face, striving to lay aside all hostility, hatred, and envy, resolving from this day forward to live in true love and unity with your neighbor. All those then who are of this mind, God will certainly receive in grace as worthy partakers of the table of Christ. On the contrary, those who do not believe this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Therefore, according to God's word, we admonish all those who are guilty of and continue in the following sins to abstain from the table of the Lord and declare that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ. All who refuse to trust in the Lord alone serve him in their own way, abuse the name of the Lord, do not diligently attend the worship services and neglect the holiness of the Lord's day, rebel against authority, violate human life, cherish hatred and bitterness, do not keep themselves sexually pure, all who by stealing or extravagance lead a, a worldly life, liars, backbiters, and slanderers, all who show themselves to be unbelieving by leading an offensive life. As long as they continue in such sins, they shall not take of this food which Christ has ordained only for his believers. Otherwise, their judgment and condemnation will be the heavier. But, beloved brothers and sisters, this warning is not intended to discourage those believers with broken and contrite hearts, as if no one might come to the Lord's Supper except the sinless. We, we do not come to this supper to declare that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves. But on the contrary, groaning under the body of this death, we seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ. We come confessing that we, we do have many shortcomings, that we do not have perfect faith. We do not serve God with sufficient zeal, but we must struggle daily with the weakness of our faith and against the evil lusts of our flesh. However, the grace of the Holy Spirit makes us sorry for our shortcomings, gives us the desire to live according to all God's commandments, and helps us fight against unbelief. Therefore, we can rest assured that no sin or weakness, which still remains in us against our will, can prevent us from being received by God in grace and mercy as worthy partakers of this heavenly food and drink. So far, the reading of the form, and we now want to come to God in prayer, and in our prayer, among other things, we will remember Brenda Wasink, who remains in the hospital and who is becoming uh, very frail. And so we will commend her to the Lord and all of his ways also for her. Let us pray.
There is no God but Thee alone. That is what we just sang, Lord. And we confess that it is true. You alone are the true and living God. And you are great and glorious. No one is so wise as you. No one is so strong as you. No one is so good as you. And we confess that together as a congregation, as we draw near to you. God, you are our help in ages past. And you are our hope for years to come. And so we pray that you will be our guard while troubles last and that you will be our eternal home. We pray for that, Lord, for all of us. We pray for it especially also for Brenda in the hospital as she continues to grow weaker and weaker. We do not know, Lord, all you have in store for her in the short term. How we thank you that in the long term, you have promised to her eternal life by your grace through your beloved Son. And how we thank you that she can also express that so clearly and so confidently. And not because of anything in herself. Lord, there is never anything in ourselves but sin and shortcoming and unrighteousness. Never is there anything in ourselves but your beloved Son came into this world and went all the way to the cross. And there, he paid it all. We thank you, Lord, for that great gospel. And we pray that you may continue to comfort Brenda's heart. And we pray that you may continue to remember her day by day and even moment by moment. Bless the care that she receives. Bless the support and love that her family provides. And... Remember her, O oh Lord, and may your will, which is always good, may your will also be done. We pray for all of us as you have gathered us here. And we thank you, Lord, for this special day, this first day of a new week, this rest day. We thank you for the gift that it is and also for the sign that it's meant to be to the world and within our own souls. And we pray, Lord, that we may keep this day that we may rest in you, Lord Jesus Christ, and that we may rest from our daily work, and that we may rest with thanksgiving and with joy, and that we may be refreshed in the Lord. As you have brought us into the sanctuary, especially we give praise for this opportunity to worship you. We pray that our minds and hearts may be filled with high and great thoughts of you. Even when our life can be full of trouble and, and turmoil, as is so often the case. We, we live in a restless world. We, we ourselves can be so restless because of trouble and, and, and trial. And, and we pray, Lord, that we may hear Christ calling, come to me and I will give you rest. So may we come, Lord Jesus, and may we receive that rest. Rest for our conscience, first of all. Whatever sin may be on our conscience, that we may confess it to you and that we may receive forgiveness. And rest also in view of all of life, that we may trust you, that we may trust your faithfulness, that we may know that you are near, and that you may guide us also in the way we should go. Yes, in obedience to your commandments, in thankfulness and praise, and also with wisdom, with all of the responsibilities of life, family life, in our working life, and being a church and a faithful congregation in a wicked world. Lord God, lead us and guide us by your word and spirit. And to that end, also bless the services today. Bless the ministry of the word. Bless our, our singing praises and, and prayers to you. Bless the offering of our gifts. Bless our fellowship. We don't just come as individuals. We come as congregation to you. And we pray, Lord, that we may experience the blessing of the communion of the saints. And we pray, too, for your blessing on this preparatory service. As we look forward to the Lord's Supper next Sunday, we pray that you will speak through the Word. So we study the last part of the Lord's Prayer, and even by way of that, those beautiful words, 
those searching words. We, we may, by your Spirit's help, also begin to get ready to eat and drink the bread and the wine in remembrance of you and to be refreshed and, and strengthened in service to you. We pray that you will bless the Sunday school children as they meet this morning for the first time this season for a brief introduction to Sunday school, to the Sunday school season and classes. And we pray that you will bless, Lord, this new season and the teachers and give them lots of strength and insight and, and blessing as they teach our children. We pray, Lord, that you may remember also all of the congregation in all of her needs, her joys, and her struggles. We commend each member to you, each family to you. We think of, of Dirk Beersaker, who will celebrate his birthday later this week, and also Art Van Vliet as well. And we pray, Lord, for both of them and their wives and families, and each of them in, in very different circumstances from the other. We, we pray for Dirk in, the, in the, the care home where he lives now. And will you remember him, Lord, in his needs? And will you be gracious to him? And Lord, remember Lida also, now apart from him because of his needs, not able to care for him in the same way anymore. Lord, also give grace and strength to Lida and bless her. And we pray for Art and Maggie and their family as, as they may look forward to celebrating together with their loved ones another birthday for Art. And we pray, Lord, that you may also uphold and strengthen Art day by day in all his ways. And Lord, all our older members, and as they experience increasingly the weakness of the body to one degree or another, that they may look to you and that you may be their, their refuge and their strength. And they, they, they may find also that you are true to your promises to, to bring us all the way through life and then into eternal life. Lord, remember every family, every, every father and mother, every child, every young person. We, we pray for those who are struggling. We pray for those, Lord, who may be totally disinterested. For those who are rebelling, we, we pray that you may remember those who are going astray. Be gracious to those who are confused. Lord, each one, speak in a way that we hear, in a way that we live, in a way that we grow. Deepen, deepen also our, our understanding and our affection and our devotion to you. And show your glory to us in a way, Lord, that we... We are in awe, and we run after you, and we delight in you. And be with us, and Lord, be with every church in our federation, and, and continue to gather and defend and preserve your people all around the world. And even as we meet as the church militant, we remind ourselves that we are in a relationship with the church triumphant. And while they may be at rest and in glory, we must labor on, and be steadfast. And Lord, encourage us. Encourage us in view of the saints that have gone before us. A cloud of witnesses. Let us run the race that is set before us. And we do so looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In whose name we pray. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord with our gifts as we May present them to him in this moment in the service for the church and for Heritage Christian School. And afterwards, let us sing together from Psalter number 292. 292, and we will sing all five stanzas.
Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, now that school is underway, most of us have returned from vacation and our home, at least for now. And wherever we have gone, and whenever we return, what a blessing it is to make it safely home. Especially if we think of the busy and dangerous highways. Probably every week we hear of collisions and sometimes, sadly, even fatalities. Even to say that, of course, brings to mind among us over the years there have been those who have lost loved ones on the road. Very painful, life-altering. And that's a reality of, of, this, of, of life in this world. And of course, when we, when we hear it, we're, we're not meant to live in, in fear or drive in fear. Or with our children beginning to drive, we're not meant to live in fear. But, but simply to recognize our dependence on the Lord's keeping. And for all kinds of reasons, I still remember years ago being with Pastor Van Essen, some, some time involved in some church visitation work, and we had to travel, and before we left, he prayed. And he said, Lord, protect us from the carelessness of others on the road. And then he said, and protect us from our own carelessness as well. We recognize our vulnerability, don't we? But now think not only of the road and of coming home from vacation or, or even from work or school or wherever. Think beyond that to the great journey of life and how we are all to live as pilgrims, sojourners, as if we are traveling through because you know we are traveling through. Whether we recognize that or not, when, when we are born, we start and then we go through life, however long, however short that may be, and then we die. And our journey's over. And the first great question is whether or not we are bound for eternal life. Whether or not we have become genuine Christians. That's the first great question. And let us all be sure about that. Don't live your life here simply to end in hell. Hopefully not. Hopefully no one living unbelieving, unrepentant. Instead we are to be bound for heaven. We are to travel as Christian pilgrims making our way to the celestial city as, as John Bunyan put it in his Pilgrim's Progress. To the city strong, secure of which we just sang from Psalm 107, ultimately the New Jerusalem as we read in Revelation 21. And when that's you and me and we're en route, as it were, on our way, then the next question becomes, will we get there? Will we make it safely home? We just read a few moments ago from the Traveler's Psalms, or some of them, Pilgrim's Psalms, as was mentioned, and how they give expression also, the ones we read, to the dangers, to the snares, to the threats. And so it is. Will we make it safely home? Will we get to that new and glorious city? And here is where the words of the Lord's Prayer, the last words, help us so much. Because they are, in essence, a prayer to make it safely home. Listen again to these words Jesus taught his disciples. Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then comes, of course, that very important conclusion. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All in all, what special words, what crucial words. All of what was just quoted but particularly now the petition, the request. And every true Christian will love, learn to love this part of the prayer and, and, and to pray it sincerely and, and earnestly and constantly. And for ourselves and for, for all God's people, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us, Lord, that we might make it safely home. It's a good prayer, isn't it? It's an important prayer. This morning, we want to consider it, and our focus will be mainly the last petition, though at the end of the sermon, very briefly, we'll highlight the prayer's last words. But mainly the petition, and, and thinking also of how we have the Lord's Supper next week, and we want to make sure that we have a right to eat, and that we do so in the right way. And one way to think about that is, is like this. The Supper is for those who pray this prayer. 
The whole prayer, of course, but also the last petition. The Lord's Supper is for those who are praying to make it safely home. See, if you have no real idea as to what that's about, then you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper. Or if you have no interest in praying it, if you have no interest in making it safely home, you'd think, what's, what's the big deal? Then, then you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper. In fact, you may not take the Lord's Supper. But when you pray as Jesus is teaching us here, in truth and from the heart, Lord, Lord, lead me, Lord, Lord, keep me, then let's realize that the Lord's Supper is for us, that, that we're meant to eat and drink, that the Lord means by the sacrament to encourage us, all his people, and to assure us that, yes, we will make it safely home. So let's listen carefully and prayerfully, and, and may the Lord bless, bless us and help us through his word. Our theme is praying to make it safely home. And, and notice three things. First of all, the dangers. Let's all recognize the dangers. Just like there are dangers on the road today when we drive. And some, some we can't help. They're outside of us. And some are, are within the car, within ourselves. We all understand dangers on the road. But what about dangers in life and on the way to eternal life? What sorts of things should we be aware of and keep in mind and recognize. Well, one is, one important thing is how weak we are at the outset. How weak we are who are traveling. I mean, just think of the fact that we are our are, are only creatures. And we, we've been made from dust. And, and the Bible says we are like a vapor and like a breath. And like a cloud that comes and disappears. And, and the Bible uses those expressions to reinforce to man, to us. Do you understand how weak you are? Now, we don't always see this, to be sure. Especially when we're young and healthy and strong. You know, if we've got muscles and we can lift weights and we can run for miles. For a brief period of our life, we think... Who's weak? I'm, I'm not weak. But then maybe we get sick. And it might only be a cold, but that can make us feel not so great. If we get a flu, we're compelled to lay down. If we get something more serious, we can't do a thing. In fact, how suddenly it can happen. We can feel strong and mighty one day, one hour. And the next we can be sick and weak. And in very short order, dying. Man is like the tender flower, and his days are like the grass. And that's true on every level. It's true physically, mentally, emotionally. It's also and especially true spiritually. Just think, what do we really know? And what are we able to do? Who has it within themselves to, to endure to the end? We don't even know how to pray left to ourselves. Paul says that in Romans 8. We don't even know how to pray, never mind the way to go. Thomas, Lord, we don't know the way. Never mind have all that's required. And so that makes the journey all the more tenuous. Yes, we want to go home, we want to get safely there, but left to ourselves, it's impossible on account of our weakness. It's good to be honest about that. It's good to recognize that, to confess that. Lord, I, I don't know, I, I can't do it. I don't have it. I'm too weak. And then add to this reality something else. The presence of enemies. Now maybe at first we don't think about that. Enemies? But it's true. When you are a pilgrim, you have enemies. When you are a Christian, when you are traveling to eternal glory, not everyone is happy about that. And so we face enemies. Enemies. Resistance. Now, what kind of resistance? What kind of enemies? Well, we've, we've, we've long been taught this, of course. Think of the devil, Satan, the adversary. You know how he hates to see pilgrims on their way to Zion. He hates that with a passion. And so while the Lord says to his people, listen, you're redeemed, you're free, the Son has set you free, Follow him into eternal life. When the Lord sa sa says that, the devil rises up in rage and he says, no way. If I can, I'll prevent that. 
And so he musters all his forces and he sets himself against the people of God and he opposes our way and he tries to make it as hard as he can and to take us back. And he is so slippery and he is so sly and he knows us very well. He studies us. He studies our weaknesses. He knows where you're vulnerable. He knows. Maybe you don't even know, but he knows. And he doesn't always come with like trumpets blaring and, and nostrils flaring. And No, he, he often comes far more quietly. The, the Apostle Paul says the devil knows how to transform himself into an angel of light. One time, one time I heard an old man explain to me, old Dutch man explained to me in a, a Dutch expression, and he translated it for me, and he said, you know, I don't worry about the devil coming to me in his wooden shoes. I can hear him coming to me in his wooden shoes. Clop, 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 here he comes. I don't worry about that. I worry when he comes to me in his slippers. When he comes up to me and whispers in my ear, try this, try that. Go this way, go that way. Why not? It can't hurt. He's harder to spot then, isn't he? He's harder to identify. He's harder to resist. But he's an enemy. And however he comes at you, however he comes at me, he wants to destroy us. And then, of course, there's the world. The world is an enemy as well. And when we talk about the world, we mean the collective spirit of, of man as, it is, it, as, as man unites in defiance against God. And it comes out in media, and it comes out in culture, and it comes out in politics. It comes out... In the academy, it comes out in the, in the talk around the water cooler. Hatred, enmity, resistance to God and his people. And we live in this world and we meet this resistance. We feel it. This sinful, the, the, the world of sinful man can never be our friend, never be our helper on the way to eternal life. At least not willingly so. And then there's a third enemy, in some ways the most dangerous of all. Because the third enemy is not, not out there and, and not in the air. The third enemy is in here. Our old sinful nature is an enemy. Remember how Paul teaches this in Romans 7. How he, he speaks about how he, he's wrestling with himself. On the one hand, he loves God's law. Because he has received a new nature. Like every Christian, you know, a new, a new mind and a new heart and a new will and new powers and new desires. And, and Paul has a new nature. And every believer has a new nature and loves to do what pleases God. But even while that's true, Paul says, I have also still an old nature. I have, there is a part of me that wants to sin still. There is a part of me that, that likes to rebel still. There is a part of me that desires to be wild still. And every Christian comes to understand that. And that is why every Christian struggles. And not just with a war outside of us, but with a war inside of us. So often the good we would do, we do not do. And the evil that we hate, that we do. I read this week again from Kevin DeYoung. I've quoted this to you before, but I've forgotten it. Kevin DeYoung, minister in the, in the United States. He says this, I often think about what a disaster I could become for the kingdom of God. I often think about what a disaster I could become. And he... he, he reminds himself by way of this to be careful, to be faithful. See, we have enemies. We're weak. We have enemies. And, and something else that is so dangerous, the battle never stops. The assaults are unrelenting. No sooner do we make it through one temptation than another one comes. Or, or, or sometimes they combine. Sometimes they multiply. Sometimes we're inundated so that we can never let our guard down. And if we do, we're immediately in trouble. Maybe one moment we've conquered lust, and the next moment we're overtaken by pride. Maybe we've been able to resist envy, 
And the next moment we're succumbing to sinful anger. Do you know what it's like to deal with temptation every day, all day long? And sometimes it can be the same sins. The same sins over and over. And not that there's never victory, but there can be no let up. Paul fought with this every day and so will every true believer. And, and so these are the dangers we, we need to recognize. The, the realism that needs to mark our life when we are pilgrims, when we are travelers, when we are Christians. If we're going to get home, boy oh boy, left to us, not a chance. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? And do you see then why this prayer is so precious then that Jesus gives us? Here we come to our second point, the special care to pray for. The special care, how wonderful and beautiful that the Lord Jesus includes at the end of the Lord's Prayer these precious words, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. These words speak to the dangers we just listed. Because what are we asking for here with these words? What do we need the Lord to do for us? Well, one thing is that he might watch over our paths. Watch over our paths. Lead us not into temptation. Watch over our ways. And, and to pray this is, is to recognize that the Lord leads, leads our lives. We may have our plans and we need to make our plans, but ultimately God is in charge. He's sovereign. And so we ask him so to order our ways, direct us, guide us, that we do not fall into temptation. Lead and guide us so that we are not waylaid by various enemies. Direct our ways so that we do not go astray. Oversee our path, my path, my steps, Lord. Let this be our constant prayer because we do not trust ourselves because we know we cannot survive. Now, in saying this, let's, let's pause to acknowledge that this is difficult for us to ask for this. It, it goes against the tendency that's within us, a tendency to think that we've, we've got this, we can do this, we can figure this out. Maybe just to illustrate for a moment, remember back in the day when we had no GPS and no Google Maps, when may, maybe we had paper maps, or we just had to know the names of roads and the directions we needed to go, and how many of us remember, it's hard to do today, but how many of us remember getting lost before? You were in some city, you were in some place, and you didn't have a clue where you were. And how many of us remember in those moments, on the one hand being frustrated, and on the other hand saying, I, I don't need help, I can figure this out. And, and maybe our wives said, you know, we should really stop and ask someone, but we said, no, no, we, we, we can do it. We can figure it out. And maybe sometimes we did, maybe more times we didn't. And we just got more and more lost. And back in those days, it could be dangerous because you could end up in places you, that weren't safe. Again, not so much a problem anymore today because of, of the technology, but, but now think in view of the road to heaven, making it safely home to heaven. Is it not still a reality? We think we, we can figure this out. That's a tendency we have. And by way of this prayer, we're compelled to confess, no, you, Lord, must lead me. You must lead me. Because I don't know how to avoid temptations. I don't know how to get through life unscathed. Left to myself, I just get more and more lost, become more and more vulnerable, go to all the bad places, get into more and more danger. I need outside help, don't you? I need divine supervision. I need God's guidance. So never be afraid to ask for that. Be deliberate and resolute in asking for it. Lead us not into temptation. Govern our lives, our steps, so that we do not end up in situations where we might not make it. We might give in or fall away or be destroyed or become disasters for the kingdom of God. No, Lord God, watch over my every step. The special care we pray for. As a kind of sidebar, let's remember that if we ask for it, we, we should also make sure we follow the guidance of the Lord. And on that point, isn't it important to regularly study God's Word? What does the psalmist say? Your Word is a lamp to my feet. 
a light to my path. And so if we are asking for his guidance, as we do by way of this prayer, then pay attention to his guidance and commit to going where he guides. Go where he leads. But there's more to this prayer because there's more to the care that we need. Not only watch over our paths, but ultimately, ultimately watch over our, our souls. Watch over our souls. That's what the last part of the prayer means. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or sometimes translated from the evil one. Both are in view, really. Both are meant. But what is the point? The point is that even while the Lord may lead us so that we avoid many temptations, and, and really we can have no idea, can we, how many temptations he enables us to avoid because he guides us. We might be going here and he just kind of leads us no away from there because if we would go there, we'd be in trouble. How often that happens, we have no clue. Maybe in glory, we'll, we'll, he'll tell, tell us some of it. How often we escape. But we cannot escape everything. Just living in this world makes that impossible. Temptations are around us all the time. Dangers are continually confronting us and we cannot escape them all. And what is more, the Lord in his wisdom and in his sovereignty may not want us to escape them all because he may want to teach us through learning to resist the temptations. He may be seeking to refine us and strengthen us in his inscrutable sovereignty and wisdom. He may still lead us through seasons of temptation. Now, it's important to be clear, he doesn't tempt. He tests. He, he never tempts. The temptation comes from, from Satan, from the world, from within, never from the Lord. But in his sovereignty, he may permit us to be tempted. And so we may have to face things. Well, we know that from experience. We do face things. We don't get free, easy rides to heaven. We may escape many things. We don't escape everything. And so we pray, watch over our souls. Now, let me just try to illustrate this for us uh, so we, we grasp it, so that it becomes tangible and practical. And let me do so by way of the danger of sexual immorality and the many forms of that. And we'll use this as an illustration because it is so commonplace, so powerful, and so dangerous. Sexual immorality and the many forms of that, including adultery, fornication, pornography, and on and on. All right, we're praying to be spared temptation. And when we pray that sincerity and we look to God's word and we follow his lead, then how many temptations we may avoid altogether. And some of it God just takes care of and, and some of we have responsibilities to address. I mean, the Lord is clear, isn't he? There are certain places we shouldn't go. And there are certain things we shouldn't see or hear or do. The Lord is clear. So this summer... One of the hit movies was Oppenheimer, if I say that right. Oppenheimer. All about the man responsible for the development of the atomic bomb, if I understand correctly. And while it might be a very interesting movie, if you looked at a review beforehand, which is always a good idea, in this case the reviews say that Oppenheimer is full of open immorality, adultery on display for all to see. Now when you know that and you know you're praying, Lord, lead me not into temptation and you know from his word how to live and how we're to set no wicked thing before our eyes, Psalm 101, because it will never help us to see that sort of thing. It'll be hard to forget what we see. We will never unsee what we have seen. So it's pretty clear, you know, we, we shouldn't see that movie. However much we may regret missing it, for the story's sake. Now, we shouldn't see it. It won't help us. Now, some of you may disagree with that, but then you'll have to work that out before the Lord and according to his word. The point is that some things we can avoid through God's leading and guidance. We can avoid and we should avoid. But then there are things that we cannot always avoid. So maybe at work, someone, a colleague dresses very immodestly or behaves very suggestively. Or what if you go with your family to the beach or on a boat ride? Or maybe you go to a store or a restaurant. In other words, you're just living your life and through no fault of your own, you see something you shouldn't see. 
or you're invited to do something you shouldn't do. And that becomes a temptation to you. I'm not describing anything strange, am I? We all understand. This happens. And, and when it happens, then we can start to wonder, we can start to desire, we can start to become very restless. Happens to men, happens to women, happens to young, happens to old. And see, when it happens, that's when this second part of the prayer becomes so relevant and so urgent. Deliver us from evil. In other words, in times of temptation, unlooked for, unwanted, unexpected even, we're living faithfully or seeking to and still we meet with danger. Then, and don't only think, by the way, of Seventh Commandment issues. I mean, there are all kinds of things related to the Seventh Commandment, but there are all kinds of other things too. Temptations to idolatry or, or blasphemy or, or, or leaving the faith or to rebel or to hate or to steal or, or to lie. And it can be one, it can be many. But whatever it is, in that moment, our souls are in great danger. Our pilgrimage is being threatened. Making it home is at risk. And how many times it can happen and to do with so many things and whoever can survive it. You can't. I can't. Which is why we pray, deliver us from evil. Watch over our souls. Through the strength of the Holy Spirit, preserve and enable us to resist the temptation, to stand against the enemies and to overcome the assault. And even then, we might not overcome. We might stumble. We might fall. How many of us know about that? But then help us, Lord, to return to you as fast as we possibly can. Deliver us from evil. Help us with wisdom and courage and fortitude. Help us to remember what's true. Help us to see the Lord Jesus Christ in this moment, what he's done, what he'll do. Deliver us from evil. This is the special care to pray for. See, we rattle off the prayer. I mean, it's easy to do that, isn't it? Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us. Do we understand what we are praying? How good this is? How important this is? And how encouraged we may be, therefore, to pray this way sincerely and constantly. And then also expectantly. And here we come to the last point, the arrival we may anticipate. Praying to make it safely home praying the way Jesus is teaching, we may be sure we will make it. We may not be sure about things on the road. We, we don't know. We, we might not make it home today. We don't know. But, but in terms of making it to heaven, we can know. We can be absolutely sure. How can we be so sure? Well, one answer is that we've got this prayer from the Lord himself. And just like with all the other requests, the Lord would never teach us something to pray for that he doesn't intend to answer. That makes sense, doesn't it? If he directs us to ask him, he intends also to do what we ask. So he will not lead us into temptation. He will deliver us from evil. He will watch over our paths. He will watch over our souls. But don't only think of that I mean, that the Lord has given us this prayer. Think also of the Lord himself. All he is and all he's done. Is he not the Lord our Savior? Even for all who trust in him? Is that not the way he has revealed himself? He saves his people from their sins. He saves his people to the uttermost. He saves entirely by his grace and for his name's sake. And he saves in a way that when we are in his hand, nothing can take us out of his hand. When we are in his love, nothing can separate us from his love. Paul writes at one point near the end of his life, 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, he says, The Lord will preserve me or deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. It's because of the Lord. And then think of one more thing. Think of all that follows this petition in the prayer. I mean now the closing words. I said we'd come back to them and here we are. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. That is simply saying, Lord, there's no one like you. That when we pray to you, we, we are praying to the almighty sovereign over all. 
We, we are praying to the creator, keeper, and redeemer. We are praying to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are praying to the one who has all power in heaven and on earth. We are praying to the one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think. We are praying to the one who loves us more than we can ever measure. He is the God who is our help in ages past. He is the God who is our hope for years to come. And then, of course, the amen to it all, which is not a throwaway word, you know. Oh, hey, we're finished. No, amen is so packed with meaning. It shall truly and certainly be. You know, this was, uh, this was reinforced to me or, or reflected to me when I visited Mrs. Wassing this past week. Two weeks ago, she could still speak. Now she can't speak. Most maybe a whisper comes out. And on Thursday when I visited her, I read to her from Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? I am persuaded that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And she looked at me and she said in her whispering voice, Amen. You know, it shall truly and certainly be. And that's how we may end the prayer. We don't pray in vain. We may be sure we will make it safely home. And next Sunday, we'll get another confirmation of that when the supper of the Lord is served. And as was said at the start, it's for every confessing Christian who wants to make it safely home and who's praying like that. And when that's you and me, then we also strive to be sure we are seeking to follow the Lord. And so this week of preparation is all about working with that. And so on the one hand, we might ask the question, are we on the way? Are we on the way? Are you on the way? If you're not, the Lord graciously calls you to be on the way and says to you, come, follow me. Are we on the way? That's one question. But likewise, are we praying to make it safely home? And praying for that in a way also that we are dealing with every temptation we meet with in order to overcome it. Not indulging it, not excusing it, whether it be in family life or with your phone or maybe to do with your overall focus in life. No, when you are praying, deliver me from evil, then you hate evil. You want to. And you love what is good. And when that's you, by the grace of God, then by all means next Sunday, receive the bread and the wine and be sure of God's promise and be encouraged to carry on knowing that someday you will make it. You will come into that holy city and you will walk on those streets of gold and you will be shown to your mansion in heaven. God himself says you will. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this prayer that you've given us that we could study over the last number of months, including now the last words of it, that remind us that we are weak, so weak, and, da and endangered, vulnerable, but that you are so good and mighty and faithful. And we pray that we may be a people who who sincerely and earnestly and continually say to you, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Watch over our paths. Watch over our souls. We thank you, Lord, that because of all you've taught us, all you are, and all we may say also in the rest of the prayer, those who put their trust in you may be sure we will make it safely home. And so be with us in this week of preparation as we, as we think on these things. And grant, Lord, that by your grace and spirit and blessing, we, we may be brought together next Lord's Day to receive the bread and the wine and to be encouraged as we remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how he was tempted. Oh, how he resisted. Oh, how he suffered. Oh, how he overcame. And so it is for his sake that we pray. Amen. Let us sing uh, the words of the Lord's Prayer in number 434. And then for our doxology, 204.
stanza two and four. Two hundred and four, two and four. Receive now the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.